Hi, Steve Bailey of Mistral Aviation, and this video is a dive into reducing the rolling shutter effect that can spoil in-flight videos of propeller-driven aircraft. I'll summarise my recommended settings at the end, and I'll put links to any products mentioned in the description. Everyone who's photographed a propeller with an action camera has seen the effect of rolling shutter. Because a rolling shutter scans the camera sensor top to bottom, the image of a moving object changes position on the sensor during the scan. So here is a simple illustration. The black rectangle represents the edges of the sensor, and the white bar at the top is to simulate the scanned area. In reality, this bar would only be one pixel high. The projected image of the propeller is in red, and the stored images are orange. As the scan starts, a part of the propeller is imaged on the sensor and stored. As the scan progresses and uncovers more of the projection of the propeller, those parts of the image are also recorded and stored. I've only shown four parts of the image, but the process is of course continuous, and the result of this degree of rotation will be a distorted image rather like the orange shape here. This can result in severe distortion, and the propeller can even appear to break up. It's the same process that's caused this jelly wobble in the glare shield and the panel. The way to reduce the effect on the propeller is to introduce motion blur. That disguises the distortion and makes the propeller movement look more natural. And to produce motion blur, you need to slow the shutter speed. There are two problems with doing this. First, slowing the shutter speed too far may cause motion blur in objects that are just vibrating a bit and that can interfere with the image stabilisation. You can see the combined effect here in the glare shield and the ethos. The stabilisation is adjustable, of course, so you can experiment. The original firmware for the GoPro Hero 10 only had three settings, off, standard and boost, but a firmware update added an additional high setting for 16x9 only. So now you have four to play with in 16x9, but still only three for 4x3 format. I prefer 4x3 because I can reframe the video in the vertical meridian and post. The second problem is that slowing the shutter speed increases the light reaching the sensor, that is, increases the exposure, and that has to be compensated, otherwise the video is going to be overexposed. Although exposure can usually be adjusted by shutter speed, lens aperture and sensor sensitivity or ISO number, action cameras generally have a fixed aperture. In the case of the GoPro that's f2.8, so the camera can only adjust shutter speed and ISO. With the lowest available ISO on the GoPro being 100, in sunshine a shutter speed sufficiently slow to blur the prop is going to result in a very overexposed video. So, to keep the shutter speed low and prevent overexposure, you need a neutral density filter to cut down the amount of light reaching the sensor. There are packs of these to fit the GoPro from Freewell and Polar Pro, or you can use conventional camera filters with an adapter. Now, the nomenclature of ND filters isn't altogether intuitive for the photographer. It works like this. For a halving of light transmission, a half transmission or one stop, the ND filter would have a value of 2. For halving it again, a quarter transmission or two stops, the ND filter would have a value of 4. Halving again would be one eighth transmission ND8. Logical, but that's three stops. And an ND32 is five stops. So it's logical to a degree, but as a photographer I really rather see the filters labelled in stops. Incidentally, I found that the Freewell ND32 filter is nearer four stops than five, so filters from different manufacturers may not be completely equivalent, and you may need to do your own measurements. If you put an ND filter on and leave the shutter speed on auto, the GoPro will reduce the shutter speed, but only so far, and it won't of course allow the shutter speed to drop below the frame rate. So if you filter out too much light, and once the camera has bottomed the shutter speed, it will start increasing ISO, which ultimately will produce a degraded grainy video. So on a bright sunny day, you may need a four stop ND filter, which is ND16, but later in the afternoon under an overcast, the light's reduced, and now you only need an ND2 one stop to get the shutter speed to your target. So with an ND16 filter in place, the camera has to increase the ISO to compensate for low light reaching the sensor, and ultimately reduce the quality of the video. So, just one ND filter isn't going to be enough. If you don't have electronic flight displays or the cameras outside the cabin, you may be fine with leaving the shutter speed on auto and uh, accepting that shutter speed and therefore propeller blur will vary. Or you may be okay with changing filters in very different lighting conditions, at least in the cabin, unless you're into wing walking. But if you do have electronic flight displays, then you may have an additional problem of matching the refresh rate of the screens to the shutter speed to avoid banding. To do this, you have to peg the shutter speed to one value, and to do that, you'll need to use an adjustable ND filter. If you leave the camera to vary the shutter speed, which it will do steplessly, continuously as the conditions dictate, then sometimes your screens will look okay, and sometimes you may see banding. 
There is also anti-flicker to consider. There are two settings on the GoPro, 60Hz and 50Hz, and you can see what effect these will have on your EFIS using Live View. To change the setting, swipe down to Settings, across to Preferences, tap General, and then scroll down to find anti-flicker. For our Garmin screens, I have found that the European standard of 60Hz is best. Now back to adjustable ND filters, uh, these vary in quality and the low-end ones can introduce undesirable artefacts. Earth make very high quality ones of various specifications. The one we need here is the ND2 to ND32 combined with a GoPro adapter and a step-up ring. This King One adapter costs £10.99 from Amazon. It's attached by grub screws that have soft covers so as not to scratch the GoPro and it can be oriented in four ways which means that you can position the scale of the ND filter so that it's most easily visible. The downside is that the adapter can be pulled off the camera if you apply sufficient force. I've never had a problem with this in the aircraft, but if it concerns you then there is the small rig vlogging cage that has a fixed adapter ring and costs about 45 US dollars, but at the time of this recording it's only available for the Hero 5, 6, 7 and 8, not the 9 or 10. The King One and small rig solutions take 52mm filters, but because variable ND filters are thicker than standard filters, if you use the GoPro on the wide setting then you'll see a vignette and you will have to crop the video in post. I calculate to avoid this completely a 95mm filter will be needed, taking account of the filter thickness and the thickness of the step-up ring, but the largest step-up from 52mm that I have been able to find is to 77mm, and with a 77mm filter occasionally you may see a small vignette, but this is easily removed when cropping from 4x3 to 16x9 in post. Of course, if you're happy with using a narrower angle of view, then you shouldn't have the problem. The next hurdle is that the ideal shutter speed that will give the best effect for propeller, banding and vibrating objects may be in between the available shutter speeds that can be set manually. Unfortunately there's no way around this unless it's possible to safely adjust the ND filter as the light varies in flight. So I find that the best compromise when dealing with EFIS is to set the shutter speed to 1 over 120 and switch image stabilization to standard, then adjust the ND filter using live view for correct exposure, preferably before departure, and erring on the side of underexposure. You will of course have control of exposure in post-processing, but you do want to avoid overexposure at all costs. You can pull the shadows up, but if the highlights are blown out then there's nothing that you can do to recover them. And remember that as you gradually increase the density of the filter, the GoPro will increase the ISO to compensate. So you need to be careful to set the lowest filter density that produces good exposure. There is another option, which is to compromise with the filter density that allows the camera to work within a range of shutter speeds to give reasonable propeller blur without pushing the ISO so high as to degrade the image quality and just accept that you will see some banding on your screens from time to time probably ND8 or 16 on clear and sunny days in the UK, and ND2 or 4 on overcast days, although having the benefit of both a co-pilot and an autopilot, I generally prefer to adjust the filter before takeoff and then in flight if the light changes a lot. So in summary, choose a shutter speed that provides decent blur without banding and without too much jelly wobble of vibrating objects, probably 1 over 120. Set the image stabilization to a level that's not degraded by the shutter speed, probably standard. Set the ND filter to the minimum density that prevents overexposure. Or leave the shutter speed on auto. Set the image stabilization to whatever works best for you, again, probably standard. Then either adjust the ND filter to the lowest setting that prevents banding of the EFIST whilst blurring the prop, or compromise with ND8 or 16 for bright days and ND2 or 4 for overcast days and just accept that there will be some variation in poplar and EFIS banding. Now eventually rolling shutters may be replaced by global shutters that record data from the entire sensor at once and the problems of distortion will be fixed. But if it's not to look like the engine's failed, you'll still need ND filters. So do please click the like button if you found this video useful and thank you very much for watching.